Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Vidya Sampath and I'm the senior uh, product manager on Amazon's disaster relief team. And I lead our network of global disaster relief hubs where we pre-position relief supplies for donations throughout the year uh, to any natural disasters that happen anywhere in the world. I'm really excited to facilitate this conversation today uh, between two really amazing individuals and two amazing organizations that they represent. We have Danielle Dres, who is the Executive Director of Global Empowerment Missions Hawaii Operations, and Jim Alvey, Vice President of Disaster Recovery at Good360. Um, I decided that I actually won't go into the details of their respective bios uh, because I want each of you to actually engage with them directly over the course of the next couple of days, um, and also because there's a fantastic um, online feature that After the Fire has put up uh, for this conference. So in the interest of time, I'm going to dive right into the topic of today's session, which, as uh, Jen teed us up, is From Crisis to Community, Service and Integration Post Maui Fires Through Collaborative Private non profit relationships. So my first question to Jim, um, from Good360's point of view, um, can you talk about what a successful and an authentic uh, private and nonprofit um, partnership looks like, um, especially in the immediate aftermath of a crisis, but also um, as long-term recovery and community rebuilding happens? That's a complicated question. Um... Just for a little bit of background on Good360, we are a 501c3, we're a nonprofit. Um, we are a matchmaker between companies that have products and nonprofits that need products. So we're matchmaking all the time. 10% um, of what Good360 does is focus on disaster recovery, which has become a specialty for me and my team, Peyton and Maddie over here. That, um, so when I say we again, that's who I mean, it's them. Um, and we match up products throughout disaster phases. So it's important for us to identify, particularly in a large scale response and recovery, as Chris was alluding to, the challenging part of recovery. Um, so the most important thing about Good360 is that we don't do anything by ourselves. We need that vetted nonprofit network. There's about 5,000 nonprofits active in a year, and we need you. We need companies that are supporting our efforts primarily with product um, and also with funding. Um, so those things are really important. Uh, for us, we try to respond in, in disasters really strategically because it can be very chaotic at first and there's a lot of players. And that certainly was seen uh, in Lahaina and it's seen at most disasters. So we pre-position product so that we can get it there quickly. We didn't have pre-position product in Lahaina. Uh, so that threw us for a curveball. Um, so we, we helped with some first responder uh, equipment, and that kind of changed our, our mindset in a couple of different ways, which is really listening more to what's going to be needed, not thinking that we know in advance what is going to be needed, but asking the nonprofits that are active, what do you need now? And we could not have projected what uh, the folks working in Lahaina could have needed. But what happened was that first long phase of recovery led to the phase that we try to be most active in, which is long-term recovery. And the most important thing for us in long-term recovery is having a place to put all the product. So warehousing is the most important thing for us. Otherwise, we've got cargo containers ready to go and no place for them to go. Um, so for us, it's establishing that, that uh, footprint. And again, all of that takes partnerships with the UPS Foundation for shipping, uh, with Maersk, with disaster relief by Amazon, with uh, funding from American Eagle, Bombas, Lowe's, uh, Coca-Cola, that helped us get ready to do what we are doing now. It took a long time to get to this spot, but when we got there, we were ready. So we need that partnership, um, and a good partnership is one that doesn't just start at the disaster. We've been working together for years. We've been working together for now a year, but it feels like years. Um, and in all those cases, having a partnership that you're familiar with, that you can be transparent with, not afraid to ask, not afraid to share when something doesn't go the way you thought, that's the ideal partnership. 
Thanks, Jim. Daniel, um, from what you've been seeing in Maui in the last year, uh, leading global empowerment missions work, how does that play out for you in terms of these collaborations? Um, what worked, but also what didn't work, because there was just uh, so much that didn't click through the way it does, um, say, in, in a wildfire out um, in the mainland US. Um, yeah, sure, thank you. I, Jim, I mirror what you're saying 100%. We don't do anything globally without partnerships. And um, as a disaster relief organization, you know, first and foremost, we're trying to get the most relief to the most amount of people in the fastest amount of time for the least amount of money. And you don't do that by yourself. And, um, you know, when it came to Maui and the recovery effort, we realized we didn't have the, we, we were brand new. We were headquartered in Miami, but it was a brand new operation that we set up very quickly on Maui. And the first partnership that we made was with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs um, because we realized we don't, we don't have even a survivor network to, you know, to understand who were, they, who were those survivors and how do you reach them to let them know that you have assistance for them. And so we did a partnership with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs as well as Airbnb.org, which was a relationship that we had, had uh, globally. And we were able to get very quickly using the reach of OHA and the resources of Airbnb.org, um, about 1,200 people in immediate housing. Um, so you know, then we continued to grow and grow the Airbnb.org partnership. Um, with a state-funded housing program where you know, we had the state of Hawaii that was paying for it, Airbnb and Airbnb.org that were providing, providing the platform, and then Jem, who was actually administering the housing side of it. So we were meeting with the survivors, vetting them, um, understanding their needs, finding a unit that worked for them, getting them set up on Airbnb if they weren't signed up yet, and then actually getting in, them into housing same day. Um, so, you know, we've got a government entity, you've got the, you know, Airbnb, the public sector, and then a nonprofit all working together towards that same cause or that, that same goal of getting people quickly housed. Um, so, you know, we continue to do that. In fact, um, are administering the state's rental assistance program, where, again, it's a partnership with Airbnb.org, and we're currently housing um, over 300 households in Airbnbs, paid for by the state um, from anywhere from six months to a year. And we just find like being able to bridge that, that gap and, and um, administer programs that are, that, you know, where we're able to get the funding from the state and able to um, have great partners like Airbnb, who's not charging any service fees for, for providing their platform. Um, it's been super successful. Can I ask you both, um, as others have said, you know, it being a safe space here, um, what were those instances in the last year where the model didn't work? And what could have been some of the reasons why? It's a, it's a great question, especially in this case. And since we are among friends, we'll just say that the usual response wasn't the right fit. Um, so what typically happens with all the initial players in, in response didn't catch the survivors. There was a vast um, number that stayed on the island, found some place to stay, and weren't being counted in terms of needing help. So they fell through the system, which was recognized by a lot of no nonprofits that came into being during that uh, first phase. But that was the biggest challenge was... Um, how do we help these folks that aren't being helped elsewhere? And that's where what you were just talking about, it was really rebellious, um, and to your credit, which is not new for Global Empowerment Mission. And that's what you do, is kind of like, let's figure this out, get there. You got there right away, you figured out what was going on, and then you started to capture who fell through the cracks. But initially, nobody wanted to believe you, and nobody wanted to be believe, um, you know, Lahaina Strong and some of the other groups that were saying there are people falling through the cracks. So that was a challenge, but we had to keep moving forward, um, and we did. So 
for, for us, just holding fast to the idea that this is gonna take a while, but if we keep asking the partners on the ground what they need now and what they project they're gonna need later, we can get ahead of it because nothing could happen fast in this, in this case. So I think the, the challenge was that it didn't happen the way most fires are unique anyway. They don't happen like any other disaster. Uh, hurricanes were prepared for, floods, we know we can do mold remediation. There's kind of a, a playbook. But fire, it's completely different and we're all still learning. In this case, it's a fire on an island. So uh, really challenging in, in lots and lots of ways. When we did the delegation in December, we came back with a list of 20 things that were different about this event versus other events. So plenty of challenges, not enough time to talk about. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge when you think about wildfires is that everyone is different. And um, in this case, we, I, I mean, I just don't think anybody knew how to write the playbook on how to do it correctly. We were all sort of, I like to say, building the plane as we were learning to fly it. And we had to figure out tools that, you know, wouldn't, hadn't been used before. Um, you know, with the rental assistance program, um, I think it's the first of its kind. And, um, you know, the, uh, we also had like huge struggles with um, a, just a lack of inventory in the housing, housing, half the housing burned down on the island, like the affordable housing. So we had to come up with solutions that were super out of the box. Like, for example, turning what, what were unutilized short-term rentals into long-term housing solutions for survivors. Um, and that just, I, I mean, we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't realize actually when the state had released the funds for, um, for, the, for the rental assistance program, they basically said, go make an Airbnb reservation for a year. And we went on to make a reservation and there was one property available. And we've got hundreds of families that need a place to go. So we really had to develop that inventory. We went out to um, real estate associations, to property managers, and, and basically pleaded our case. Like, these units are sitting empty currently. Um, they can be used to help assist uh, surviving households. Like, and all you got to do is, you know, work with us. We'll get it on Airbnb. It's usually, it's probably on Airbnb at this point, but get it priced at a point where we can afford it as a state long term and can best utilize those funds for the longevity of this recovery effort. I wanted to add one that, that I think is really important that we both faced, which is we are not from Hawaii. Um, that's a big deal. So gaining the trust of the nonprofits and the government that were active there was a huge challenge. Thankfully, after the fire got us, um, many of us on, on the island, to start establishing relationships, see what was happening. But I'm understating how difficult that is to gain trust uh, in, in a culture that's been challenged with trust. So that became really important to us for, for both of our organizations. Um, and it was, it was um, there were failures, I would say, where we tried and it didn't work, so we had to back off a little bit and just wait till that trust came. And it, I think it, it's still growing, um, but I think that should be mentioned as one of the challenges. Yeah, I think I want to respond to that um, as well in terms of uh, the concept of earning trust, but then also maintaining that trust. Because um, one of the things that um, we found on our uh, team uh, as Amazon's disaster relief um, frontline team, what we tried to do was exactly what you said, which is say, hey, we have all of these products, and then all of our partners said, none of it is useful. And so trying to figure out, okay, put all of these supplies aside, how can we help you? And I remember getting the call from Good360 saying, we need all of the protection devices um, in terms of the ash and the soot covers so that when people walk back, they're not bringing all of that back. And then trying to see within Amazon's inventory, what does that, what does even that product look like and where do we have it and what is that inventory? And then quickly pulling the logistics together to get that on planes heading to Maui. Um, we worked with a couple of other partners that um, asked us for um, uh, ways in which 
we could support their mass feeding programs. So we were like, great, we have supplies in the hubs, we can send you spoons, forks, cutlery, whatever you want, we can send it to you. Putting all of that on a truck, and then they said, is any of that plastic? And we said, yes. And they said, absolutely do not send that to us, we need them all to be compostable. And so we learned so much about how we were not ready for the moment. And so one of the big changes that we've had to make as a team and as a service offering to our uh, community partners is we've done two things now. So our main hub that's in Georgia that supports all disasters, um, there are no single-use plastic items in there anymore. They're all compostable. And that was directly as a result of the requirement that was placed on us um, and the bar that was set for us in terms of how you do not bring single-use items uh, onto this island, and we changed our whole model. But then we also realized that we had nothing when it came to wildfires. Uh, and so now, just a couple of weeks back, we have started a wildfire hub concept where, thanks to the work of Good360, but also incredible partnership with after the fire in terms of the organizations and the volunteers you put us in touch with, we now have items that support both the personal protection needs of um, folks following wildfires, but also mitigation equipment like um, fire pumps and um, uh, goggles and neck gaiters, and I'm forgetting all of the many items uh, right now, but um, it goes back to what you said about making sure that you earn that trust and then you find ways to maintain that trust. Um, so, Jim, I'll come back to you then. Um, you talked about how there were lessons learned. So, are you also pivoting what you're doing as an organization? And are there some examples you can share? Sure. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't name a couple of the nonprofits that we are working with that represent what I'm gonna talk about. Alfie's here, uh, thank you so much. Um, we, we were able to help him with an event that would seem small for anybody else, but it ended up being very, very, um, providing a lot of hope for the teams. So um, at Rebuild Maui, uh, CNHA, Anti Neti, Salvation Army of Maui, um, Lahaina Strong, and of course, Nicole, wherever you are, uh, Maui Rapid Response, who kind of set the tone um, with a two, three-person operation um, from, the, from day one. Um, we listened to what they were doing. And that actually is uh, where, what I'm gonna, my answer is that now we're doing that more. Our team is focusing on long-term recovery, really getting into the long-term recovery groups, sticking around, asking them what they need, and keeping that going and finding creative ways that they thought was a dead end, whether that's a container instead of a warehouse or finding other ways to share product in warehouse space with a neighboring nonprofit. There's a lot that can be done if you open up the doors and just change the way that you do things. So that's what we're doing. We're digging in locally. Sure, we'll respond to international uh, crises when we can, but our focus has now changed to really making that, that impact that it's... Uh, it's uh, it's not, the numbers aren't going to be great, right? But that's not what it's about. It's going to be about really feeling good like we do in Sarasota County from Hurricane Ian and from uh, Hurricane Ida in Louisiana. We're really making a difference. So that's the, that's the pivot that we've made is to really localize the work that we're doing. I wanted to point out another super successful story, um, and that is our partnership with the County of Maui and a West Side Distribution Center that we were able to get um, upstanding and operational within a month of the fires. And that's a, a huge successful partnership, not just be, between you know, the county, but also with the, the Maui Food Bank and Hawaii Food Bank and um, the Hawaii Food Service Alliance and, and people who, you know, everybody stepped in. Jem had the, the expertise in how to run a warehouse like that, but we weren't, we weren't donating all that food. And so it's just another way where you know everybody fills a gap and works together and makes you know really successful. I think we were we were servicing about three thousand drive-through vehicles per week. So you know we really didn't we didn't talk about what we did together. No. <laughs> so the reason that we're on stage together is that we did figure out that warehouse challenge. When I went in in December with after the fire, 
we went, uh, Nicole took me around to a bunch of places, some others helped us, FEMA took me around to a couple. There was nothing to be had for a reasonable price or what was needed. So we started the search, and the search led to Jem, who was already there, already establishing kind of a foothold, and we said, is that a large enough space? Because we're gonna be sending containers of product. And they said, well, we actually, we were thinking about getting another space. So we're helping to fund the space that we're in now. We re rebuilt it, it's beautiful. And one uh, criteria that Good360 had, and, and Maddie was the one that kind of pushed this, was to say, let's not sign anything unless it's gonna be open to all the local nonprofits. They need to have access just like we do. Um, and so that's been, that's been great. It's still not taken full advantage of. We're going to have to broadcast that, I think, because it's too, too good to believe. But there's warehouse space available for local nonprofits. Nicole has used it for Maui Rebel Response. Salvation Army is a couple of containers of mattresses there. Other local nonprofits are happening. So just the collaboration to figure out, okay, this is the need. Let's do this together. And yes, we're from the outside. We want to let we want to support what the locals are doing. We're not trying to do it ourselves. And also, we've got three open office spaces currently. So, if any local CBOs are looking for um, extra office space or any office space, um, as well as warehouse storage space, we do have that available. We just opened our doors about a month ago. So, very excited about that partnership. Um, I, I like that like immediate, very specific call to action that you have for um, the space that's available and sharing that. Um, anything else as we close this conversation that you want to be um, sure that you shared in terms of? Yeah, just really quickly, yeah. I would say that we're talking now about the prepositioning that you have done for fires because it's an active fire season. So as recently as last night, you were saying, what are you hearing on the ground? What do they need? And that's disaster relief by Amazon. You may not love Amazon overall. I do, actually. But disaster relief by Amazon, they're the renegades at Amazon, and they get stuff done, and they're super strategic. So I just want to give you credit for that. Thank you for all you guys do. This is like speed dating for fires. We don't have enough time to do a lot of question and answers. But if, if you don't mind, um, Zeke in the back is going to speak at, because we are releasing this as a podcast as well, so it has to be loud. Um, but he did want to acknowledge something that was so positive um, from Amazon. Amazon actually sent staff to the Lion Civic Center Amphitheater so that we could establish a mobile EOC so that they could also video conference you know, throughout the state with the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, as well as the Maui Emergency Management Agency in Wailuku. Uh, also, something that's really huge that Jem did was they, they took community members that lost everything shopping for tools. And so we have community members that, that have trades under their belt, but they didn't have tools. And now that they have tools, they're helping rebuild a lot of these homes in Lahaina. So that was huge, Malo. Hey, Jen, I'm going to play Phil Donahue. You don't even know who Phil Donahue is. Where are you going? Because I'm Phil Donahue. I'm going to give this mic to, to this guy af after this. Okay, and then we'll call it. So, Alfie, if you could just talk about kind of the almost grassroots work that you're doing. Um, so there's big programs out here, but when we heard about what you're doing, we wanted to help out. I just want you to share what you guys are doing. Okay, well, thank you. Yes, um, my name is Alfie. And um, I'm the executive director of Rebuild Maui. Uh, I had the opportunity to be involved with an event we called Flowfest. And the basis of that event was just imagine you have a, a stack of kids who just need mental health resources, right? They're sitting here. And you have a lot of therapists sitting over here who want to help this group of kids. But before the fire, we didn't know how to get those two groups together. So magically, after the fire, we don't automatically know how to get them together. We just didn't learn. And so, you know, we were impacted. We lost our home. We lost three businesses in the fire. And we, we would see what was happening to our kids. So we created this biggest dance we could dream up. It was at the Ritz-Carlton. We ended up having about 600 kids attending. Well, what we had there, too, is we had a bunch of therapists that were working the event. This became a non-clinical 
non-threatening environment to just, what I was just sharing with someone was like, imagine you have this wonderful single friend that you just love, and you have this other single friend that you love too, but you're like, man, I wish they could just meet. Yes, yes, we've been doing it for centuries, but we just haven't applied it to kids and therapists. So what we did, we threw this huge, magnificent party, and I wanted games there because I thought that, hey, if we could have games there, we could encourage our kids to become playful, which would lead them to dance, which would lead them to be, kind of drop some of these walls down. And so we had big Jenga, big Connect Four, huge dodgeball game on the outside, which was controversial, but it turned out very, very, very well. And then we had um, a big twister, and we had a, a huge like you know photo booth where all the therapists were working. Well, we did not have the funding worked out. I had zero funding set, nothing, zero. I just went forward and did this. So stupid and super naive. Actually, it was canceled. It was actually canceled because I didn't have the money. I got in touch with this man, thank you so much. And I was like, listen, we need games at this event, right? We just need something for the kids to do and play. And we had all the games arrive in time. And it was really cool because he was so interested in making sure that those things arrived for us. So what that resulted in is all the kids, they came in, they played, and the, the comments we got were, I've never seen, I've never seen, so it's like, uh, so interactive, so playful. You know, we wanted to teach them how to not take shots in the bathroom. That's really what we were trying to teach them. But it turned out that they were just becoming themselves. So, hey. Uh, 10 seconds, Brian, go ahead, and then I'm going to um, close it up. I just want to give another shout out to Amazon. I'm Mariana from American Red Cross. <clears throat> and it was um, Hurricane Maria. And we were having trouble getting our supplies into Puerto Rico through commercial flights, and we could not get life-sustaining supplies to the workers and to the people we were trying to help. And we got a call from Amazon, and you said, what do you need, Red Cross? We'll send a prime plane, anything you want. And I want to thank you for that. Right on. Well, thank you all. From crisis to community, this is about all of us, but thank you.